Thanks. Good morning. I hope nobody's too cold out there. Um, <laughs> please feel free to just ask questions or interrupt me as you go. And I know it's going to be hard for people to, to run around with microphones throughout the talk. But don't be shy. Raise a hand, shout out an answer, and I'll be happy to you know, repeat it back and help and make sure that everybody hears you. So don't be shy. So how do you create transformative impact with AI? The answer is actually you just stick to your fundamentals. I'm going to go through what that means for Deliveroo today. So Deliveroo's offer to customers is that we want to give you your favorite restaurants delivered fast to your door. It's a fun, lighthearted, very 21st century value proposition. Everything's convenient. It's just there for you. Open your phone and you've got it. Okay. What this looks like as a business problem is that you actually need to satisfy three different kinds of users, each of whom cares about very different things. So first, you've got your, they're all sort of customers, but we call them, you know, we, we, we focus on the eater, who we tend to call our customer. So your first type of user is your customer or your actual eater. These people are the people that are going to pick up their phones and, and, you know, press that they would like their, their food. Your next type of user is your riders. Okay, these are your couriers. What they care about is making as much money as possible per unit time. Your third type of user are your restaurants. What they care about is having a fast, reliable delivery partner that's going to help them put their best foot forward for their customers. It's going to help them create an awesome dining experience every time. So in order to make these three kinds of users happy, this is an image that's probably going to suggest a type of problem that's familiar to all of you. This is a very hard optimization problem. Okay? You need to look at all the orders that you have coming in. You need to look at where they're all distributed in space. You need to look at where all of your riders are distributed in space. And you need to look at where all the restaurants are distributed in space. And then you need to form the best matching or assignment of riders to orders. The orders are coming in in real time. So this isn't a case of a, a postal system where you get everything in a big batch and then you have all night to sort of process and think about it. The orders are coming in in real time and you tell people you're going to give them their food in half an hour. So this is very, very quick. You don't have a lot of time to, to perfect or optimize things. And everything is uncertain. You don't know when you're going to get your next order request. You don't know if a rider that's logged on right now is going to stay logged on, or if other riders are going to log on. When you send a rider an order request, you don't know if they're going to say, this looks like an order I want to do, or no thank you. When a rider starts moving, it could take them five minutes to go a distance, or it could take them 20. So there's a lot of uncertainty. There are a lot of real-time aspects. So this problem is sort of the cell phone age, nightmarish realization of a lot of textbook optimization problems. And you simply can't solve it. So the name of the game for Deliveroo as a business is to find the best approximation they can. And the opportunity for the business is to find better and better and better approximations. So there are a lot of ways to tackle that hard problem and tackle the real problem, which is finding the better and better approximations. We really took a page from the Y Combinator playbook following this famous bit of advice from Paul Graham. He said, one of the most common types of advice we give people at Y Combinator is to do things that don't scale. What that means is that to build something quickly that solved this big, nasty problem, or, or that gave us our first approximate solution to this big problem. We didn't wait years and years to build a perfect artificial intelligence system. Instead, what we did was we hired a bunch of McKinsey analysts. We gave them Google Sheets. And we said, figure it out. And all of these people sort of developed processes for, for doing this. So that was a really successful way to get a company off the ground. And in fact, we started in January 2013. 
This red dot here in May of 2016 is when we really seriously started building automation. We got all that way through four rounds of funding, got launched in 12 countries, and at that time we were up to 75 cities. We're up to 200 cities now. But we came a huge, huge, huge way by doing things that don't scale. Paul Graham would be proud. And because we got so far, before we really started to, to build AI and to build algorithms, this presents a really fun case study in the impact that building algorithms can have at a company that's already at international scale. So that's why this is kind of a fun story that I get to share. And that's what I'm going to talk about how you can get impact, what we did to, to get that impact with that large opportunity. So I want to break this down. The impact of AI is made up of AI and impact. So <laughs> let's, let's clarify terms there. I'm sure I'm not the only person in the room who has no idea what artificial intelligence is. What I mean by artificial intelligence is what's sometimes called IA, or intelligent automation. Okay, we're, we're, we are talking about algorithms that automate a bunch of human decisions into an optimization algorithm, which then allows you to, to sort of control and improve your processes over time. And so what I mean by that is, in May of 2016, we started with this system that was not automated. Our technology platform in May of 2016 was heavily reliant on manual input. Okay, so customers would place orders. Sometime later, a restaurant worker would then decide that it was time to call for a rider for the order. So a restaurant worker would press a button that would enter, and enter the order into the system. The system was basically not doing anything with it, not thinking about the order up until then the restaurant worker would decide to enter, when to enter the order into the system. The order would then enter a first in, first out queue and would just grab the, the nearest rider when its place in the queue came up. There were thousands of restaurant workers and hundreds of delivery workers making the manual decisions that made the system work. As I just said, the restaurant workers made the critical logistical decision of when to send a rider. There were also hundreds of delivery workers that would also make that decision. So they would watch individual orders and try and guess whether the restaurant had forgotten to make the decision, right? And then they would make this difficult decision about whether it was time to override it. Then there were all the estimates. Some of the estimates were made on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, so we had hundreds of workers making real-time decisions about what the network delay was, so that, rider, so that customers would experience their food as being on time. And then we had restaurant workers and delivery workers making hourly and daily and weekly decisions, all from different you know, rationales on what the food time estimate was going to be. And then delivery workers were making velocity estimates from a variety of rationales. And here's what I mean by intelligent automation. So we got to a place where there are no manual inputs into that system. All of the time estimates are made by machine learned models. And all of those time estimates feed into an algorithm that's completely automated. So nobody's saying, I should send, a, send for a rider for this order now. Nobody's saying, I think the network delay is about six minutes right now. It's all fully automated. And so here's the impact. This has totally transformed the way that we do business. So I'm going to walk through these. but. There's greater context that isn't even on the slide. All of this is against a backdrop of 150% growth and against a backdrop of eliminating tedious manual tasks that people had to be employed to do when we're talking about hundreds or thousands of people. So against that backdrop of 150% growth, so our network being pressed harder than it had ever been pressed before, 
and against the backdrop of people not having to do anything anymore, we made all kinds of users happier. We made all three kinds of users happier. Okay, so from the customer side, late orders went down by 40%. Order duration went down by 12%. So people are getting their food more when they expect it, more on time, and in general faster. Rider to restaurant time went down 13%, so riders are just making more money. And late pickup was down 48%, so restaurants are getting a much, much more reliable delivery partner that they can depend on and are happy to work with. So I talked about what we did, what I meant by AI, going from that manual system to a very automatic system, and we've shown that it had a massive, massive impact. And so the rest of the talk is just talking about what we did to make that happen. So, as I said, to make this happen, we've really stuck to our fundamentals. What I mean by that is incrementalism, bias to simplicity, and rigorous experimentation. There isn't a silver bullet. We have not used cutting edge, deep learning techniques. We haven't used the latest libraries. It's just good old fashioned scientific and engineering research methodologies. Incrementalism, simplicity, and rigorous experimentation. Now these things are all really important, as anyone will tell you, but the fun thing about the Deliveroo story is that you can actually see how they went into action. So let's start with incrementalism. Remember, we were coming from here, from a very manual platform, to here, a fully automatic platform. So we weren't building the fully automatic platform in a vacuum. It wasn't a, a research project and it wasn't a sort of pre-launch development. We were building this at a company that was already functioning and had very sharp, very fast competitors. So we needed to do this quickly and, and keeping all of that in mind. There were hundreds of millions of dollars staked against you know, beating some competition and really moving things forward. So this is a great example of what it means to really push yourself to be incremental. So, the first thing we did for this is we broke up, we looked at the difference between where we were at and the goal state, and we broke that up into different themes, okay? Each of the themes is fairly self-contained. The idea is there are three machine learned models, the travel time model, the rider delay model, and the food prep model. Those models then combine to form an objective function and the objective function then plugs into a solver. When you have those three models, you put them together into an objective function and you use a solver to minimize that objective function, you now have your optimization algorithm. So that is taking everything that all those thousands of people were doing in sort of distributed, non-centralized ways and putting it all together into a collection of these three or five themes that can then all be continually iterated on and optimized and improved. So first we identified all of the themes, and then we had to sequence them and decide which ones we were gonna work on first. So the sequencing was really important for getting incremental value as we went. First, we had to do the travel time model and the rider delay model and the food prep time model because everything else depended on those. We picked the travel time model first because you could already plug it into the existing system and begin to get a little bit of a win. Remember that the existing system did just grab the nearest rider. You could have the existing system instead grab the rider that was going to get there fastest. So you immediately begin to get wins there. Right? The, ride, the, the customer gets a little bit more accurate of an estimate and the, the system gets a little bit more efficient. Plug in the rider delay model, all of a sudden the, the customers get much better delivery time estimates and they're, they're, they get frustrated much less often. But all of these machine learn models had to go live before we could do the objective function because the objective function is made of these things, right? You can't build the objective function without the models that make it up. And then of course the objective function itself has to go live before you can build the solver. 
The solver, by the way, is not any particular textbook solver, but we borrowed really heavily from the vehicle routing problem literature. So you can't find VRP solvers that are going to tackle one of these problems really, really, really well, but a lot of those concepts are very powerful and very useful. So I'll refer to it uh, repeatedly throughout as a VRP solver for vehicle routing problem solver. But that had to come last after the objective function and all the machine learned models. But then once we got this minimum viable product for everything, we could then decouple them all and parallelize. There are no longer independence, interdependencies like there were at the beginning. So once you get to here, the horse is out of the barn and you can just let it run. And you can have multiple teams working on these in parallel. One thing that's really important about this sequence is that every single step was a live experiment. So that let us check that we were going in the right direction. And it also let us go quickly in the sense that we didn't spend a lot of time prototyping something, you know, fuss around, see if it works, and then maybe experiment on it. Because the answer that you get with a live experiment is often very different from the answer that you get with offline analysis. So every single step here was a live experiment that, that generated value or didn't. So why did we bother breaking everything up like that? <laughs> ah. Why didn't we just do it right the first time? So this is a, an impulse that I feel very deeply myself, and I expect that a lot of people in this room feel, and it's kind of part of our discipline to, to tackle this impulse and recognize that it's a bit of a false question. There's no such thing as doing it right the first time. Doing it right the first time actually means doing it wrong again and again and again and again as quickly as possible. You're always trying to do the least wrong thing, not the right thing. And why is that? So our total dispatch algorithm is still getting large, large improvements two years later. That means that we still haven't figured out how to do it right. So if we'd waited more than two years before ever delivering any value, that would have been really bad for the company. So, so getting those little bits of value along the way have really helped the company to make it as far as they've made it. Another thing is that in competitive environments, on-demand food delivery is heating up. There are a lot of entrants into the space. That means that the expectations of restaurants and customers and riders are shifting somewhat radically on a time scale of about six months. So if you spend two years trying to build the perfect thing, it'll be obsolete about 25% of the way through your build, and you will have just wasted a whole lot of time and again delivered no value. Finally, as I've mentioned a couple times, this problem is just too hard to solve. You can't sit down with a pen and paper or even really extensive and elaborate months worth of, worth of computer simulation and determine what the right thing to build is. So this is a, a sort of a nasty bit of industrial reality, but it's also the fun part, right? If you wanted to solve problems that you could solve without trying to kind of hack around, you could solve that in academia. The, the, the rubber sort of hits the road here when it's too hard. So what we have found to work is using a moderate amount of theory, using a moderate amount of offline analysis and simulation, and then leaning really heavily on just trying it, putting it out there and experimenting on it. And those two things together help us to go fast. We would go nowhere if we tried to solve this problem that's totally beyond the state of the art of difficulty with you know, just our brains. We're not that smart. Just regarding the market uh, changing over sure. time, uh, do you see that happen progressively? And could you anticipate when it becomes critical to start modeling things uh, again? Or do you think like a, a specific transition point where it's very clear it's a moment? Sure, so the question was, can you anticipate when the market is going to be changing and sort of bake that into your development cycle, or do you really just need to react to market changes? And I think that the, the, the notion of the market change here 
is basically a placeholder for you can't anticipate what competitors or what the market are going to do. So the whole notion of the market change here is basically saying these are things you can't bake in. You simply don't know what Just Eat is suddenly going to announce in their, in their quarterly statement, right? You simply don't know what Uber Eats is going to do. So yeah, you, you really can't bake it in. In fact, to the, the degree, the, the way that you do bake that in is by saying, we're simply not gonna have a two-year development cycle. We're baking in a bit, of, a bit of temporal discounting by saying, if you can't tell me what the, what the value of this is gonna be in three months, I'm gonna have a real hard time believing that this is delivering value in two years. Does that make sense? Yes? I mean, that's where it's fun, right? That's the, that's the secret sauce and, and that's the hard part. You have to use judgment, you have to use experience, you have to have a team of really smart people that are asking themselves the hard questions all the time. I think the, the real answer is the hard questions. You get that team of really smart people and then they have to say it's not that we're trying to solve a theory problem. It's that we're trying to solve a really, really hard business problem. And they have to you know, use their judgment and learn that judgment by trial and error to make sure that they're asking the right thing. Does that make sense? For your optimization solver, from day one, you, you start to see some great, pretty algorithm or you just try different uh, optimization algorithms and try to pick one of the best. What's your, your recommendation from there? Sure, so the algorithm, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the optimization a little bit later, so, so maybe we can come back to that. The question was, how do you iterate on the optimization algorithm? How did you pick it? Did you go greedy from day one, or, or what was the sequence of things that you tried? Uh, I, I can say a bit about it. I'll, I'm gonna say that in a couple slides. So that was incrementalism. Let's talk about the bias to simplicity. This one is really nasty. To, to the question in the back, you know, it's, it's cute to say incrementalism. It's also very easy to say incrementalism. What does incrementalism actually mean? I think that bias to simplicity is the worst of these three in that regard. Every single person in this room will tell you that simplicity is the most important part of the job. And if you're doing things in a way that's too complicated, you're not going to succeed but every single person in this room has a totally different idea of what simplicity means. So simplicity is like beauty. It's completely in the eye of the beholder. So I wanna to offer to you some judgments that reflect our simplicity aesthetic and talk about what those mean to us and, and how that's made us successful. You can use that as you like. I'm breaking this up into machine learning and optimization, which are very sort of different areas. So the simplicity in machine learning is gonna be a little bit technical. Feel free to check your email if you're not interested in the technical part. I'll give you a warning when we, in a couple slides when we come back to, to the ground. Okay, so we still use a generalized linear model. We still use logistic Poisson and Gaussian regression for absolutely everything. So you could call these models classic. You could also call these models ancient. Why are we using these instead of deep learning or at least trees? The reason is that with really careful sampling and feature engineering, you kill two birds with one stone. One is that you understand your problem very deeply. You gain domain knowledge that's gonna accelerate your trajectory forward. And at the same time, you get really good features and really good training set samples that make these classic or ancient models really work very well. If you put in all that work to, to, to gain the insight about your problem, which you're probably gonna have to put in anyway, these are gonna be really hard to beat. They'll obviously be beat eventually, but two years in, we haven't beaten them yet. So, if you really roll up your sleeves and put, it, put your statistician hat on and, and really get down in the mud, the generalized linear model is just real hard to beat. We haven't gone there yet. We will eventually. We try trees every now and then. We've tried a deep neural network. You know, haven't really gone for it, but we've taken a look. It just hasn't paid for itself yet. Yes? 
We have used XGBoost for. It's really true. Um, it can be great in a lot of cases. However, sometimes it's simply, you know, it, you can do surprisingly well with linear regression. Another thing about, another thing about XGBoost, you can have data scientists in terms of speed and, and really getting things going and getting that value per unit time. You can have data scientists set up a training pipeline in R. So they can do model selection in R. Very, very fast to do model selection in R, right? Then you can set up a training pipeline in a mixture of Python and R, plug it into your ETL. That's not sexy, glamorous uh, technology, but the fact is it's real fast. You can get, a, you can get a, a linear model retraining like that super fast. And then because it's just a Gaussian linear model, engineers can hard code a combination of that into their production environment of choice, right? So your training and scoring environment, that port is incredibly easy with a Gaussian model. If you go with a randomized forest or gradient boosted tree ensemble, you're gonna have to get some kind of library or you're gonna have to have engineers really buckle down in order to do that and the, the library ports can be flaky. So there are other ways beyond model selection that this, that this uh, that it, there are other parts that make up the hurdle, the linear model hurdle that other things have to beat. And we've just found that we've gotten really far and done a lot of good stuff without surmounting that hurdle yet with other methods. Okay. We overuse linear models. We overuse linear regression. So we use linear regression for at least one quantity that is time. So time is, of course, only positive. Gaussians can be anywhere in the real line. It works. It works really, really well. Technically, we should be using something like a gamma regression or at least a Poisson regression. It's so easy to fit the linear model. It's so fast to fit the linear model that you, know, you have to go pretty far along your development cycle before a really hard-nosed look at model selection says the other models pay for themselves. In a lot of cases, obviously not in all. We would not advocate for fitting a, a binary outcome with a linear model, right? But don't be shy to use linear models for all kinds of positive quantities like time. At least give it a try. We violate independent and identically distributed. We violate IID all over the place, and we just don't worry about it. We have lots of regularization. We have empirical validation methods. We have lots of data. It's fine. Check it, but whitening your data, finding ways to, to resample it so that it's actually IID are very, very, very famously difficult. And you know, don't, don't kill yourself on that. Scale nor uh, the question was, do we not do any scale normalization before training into a model? Yeah. Um, do you mean scale normalization, like making sure all of your features are on the same scale? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do do that. That's, that's a bit of a separate issue. So we, def we do normalize predictors and things like that. Sure, so we, all of these things are rubrics that we've found to work by checking outcomes. These are not principles, these are not theoretical ideas. I mean, certainly don't take them as principles. These are anti-principles. I'm saying these are places where we have found that the outcomes are fine. And finally, we lean really heavily on empirical validation. This is probably not surprising to a lot of people in this room, but Closed form, closed form analytical validation statistics are classic parts of, of theory. They're very difficult to get work in these set, to, to work in these settings. We're breaking the IID assumption. Uh, we're using regularization. It's very hard to get p-values or your f-change statistic or your Aki Ike's information criterion to work in these settings, and it, you just don't need to. You have reams and reams of data a lot of the time. Use that data to, to empirically validate your models. Yep. 
So with predictive models, we use a two-stage validation process. First, we're never doing predictive models for their own sake. As mentioned, we're only caring about predictive models as they plug into a system and give that system better operational characteristics. So two-stage validation. First, we do offline validation just to, to give ourselves a good back of the envelope check. And then we, we plug something into the algorithm and run an experiment on it to see if the algorithm actually makes customers and riders and restaurants happier with business metrics. So I think you're, you're asking about how do, we, how, do we check things in the, how do we check things in the offline validation stage. For our predictive models, we lean really heavily on Hasty, Tibshirani, and Friedman's one standard error rule. So we will look in the validation set. We will find ways to, to carve up the validation set into approximately ident, uh, independent and identically distributed objects. And we will compute the mean, mean validation metric and the standard error of that validation metric across all of the validation, validation set objects. And then we'll pick the model, the technique, whether it's a tree or it's a linear model, if it's a linear model, what, what the feature set is that gives the, the best validation metric that is the simplest model within one standard error of the, the most that is within one standard error of the, the best validation metric result of the more complicated model. Wow. <laughs> um, no, don't clap. I messed that one up. But, but it's, it's Hasty, Tipshirani, and Friedman's you know, rubric that they call their one standard error rule. It's in Elements of Statistical Learning. It's a PDF online. Good book. I, I'm sorry. I think there was a question behind. Sure. So all of our all of our validation is uh, one standard error rule in a on, on an empirical holdout set. That's the offline validation. We never take that at face value, even if it's something like the travel time model, which you'd think it's obviously going to work if it's more accurate offline. We always plug it in and run a live experiment on it. We found many times that when you get a more accurate offline machine learning result, you plug something into a live entire system, and the system gets worse. So two stages. Yes. Not the, yes, when something is, we, we have not yet gotten to the point where, so for example, we haven't used XGBoost, found that it works better by more than one standard error in a holdout set, and then said, well, it's just too complicated, we're not going to implement it. In fact, XGBoost hasn't gotten one standard error yet on the generalized linear model. Stacking or blending after regression? Do you mean like fallback models? Yeah, yeah that, that's a, that we, we, all of our models are actually a series of fallback models. Okay, so machine learning, we don't cut corners on feature engineering or regularization. Feature engineering is, is where a lot of this, where a lot of this actually, you know, succeeds. That's where you put your domain knowledge and your sampling and all the, the unsexy rolling your sleeves up fundamentals in, and that's where it works. I'm, I'm going to hang off on questions for, for an, until the end, unless you know, something's really, really unclear at this point, then I'm happy to chat because we're going to run out. OK, so in optimization, uh, two points. First, we don't use a really fancy solver. So the, the, the vehicle routing problem-ish problem that we solve is an integer optimization problem that's a very, very difficult class of problems to solve. And there are all kinds of state-of-the-art solutions with really fun and scary names like math heuristics or ant colony optimization or particle swarm optimization. Each of these is basically hill climbing. And none of them works off the shelf for every problem. Each of them requires really intense domain knowledge to get it working. So we kind of just said, well, we'll try straight hill climbing and then use all the domain knowledge and see how far we get. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're not using a genetic algorithm or particle swarm. We are literally using deterministic hill climbing. And then we're putting a lot into, into the domain knowledge that makes up the system. And we've gotten really far with that. Again, using empirical validation to, to make sure that we're not missing opportunities. That's not to say 
that fancier techniques won't work in the fullness of time, but to the point where we've gotten to so far, we haven't seen it. The other thing is that we radically approximate the objective function. So the objective function is an expectation. It's a statistical expectation. It's often something like the mean order duration across all orders. That we build up from a nonlinear combination of the machine learned models, the travel time model, the prep time model. Those are themselves expectations, right? The travel time isn't exactly five minutes. That, that's an that's a expectation about it. The nasty bit there is that the objective function is, the, is mathematically the expectation of a nonlinear combination of expectation, or it's the expectation of a nonlinear combination. That is not generally equal to the nonlinear combination of the expectation. So for example, we have, this might be the travel time model giving you an expectation of x, and, and the prep time model giving you an expectation of y, and you're taking the max of those. That's not equal to the expectation of the max. So Instacart had a great blog post. It was really, really pretty cool. They go and they do it, right? So they have a big Monte Carlo simulation, and they compute that expectation of the, of the nonlinear combination through brute simulation force, right? And it's, it's great. It's really, it's really nice. Statisticians have been grossly abusing expectations and grossly abusing these kind of rules for 100 years. Look at the method of moments. The method of moments, you're just you know, abusing these things all over the place. The, the derivation for the AIC looks at a single observation of a number and calls that the expectation of the number. And you know, the world moves forward. Things have not completely broken down. So we just borrow from that playbook. We're not as sexy as Instacart. We just say the expectation of the nonlinear combination is equal to the nonlinear combination of the expectations, and we've gotten pretty far with that. Finally, we don't cut corners in optimization on the neighborhood operators. So for people in the room that are more familiar with machine learning than optimization, neighborhood operators are, in optimization, analogous to the features in machine learning. So this is a sort of analogous truth here. Just like in machine learning, you really don't go small on feature engineering. You really don't go small on neighborhood operators and optimization. This is where you roll up your sleeves and you really think hard about the problem and you don't take things off the shelf at face value. That's been very, very successful. OK. This is last but definitely not least. We have rigorous experimentation. This was the first part of the talk because in many ways I think it's the most important. Uh, somebody told me that I could not go to a machine learning and AI presentation and start with experimentation or I would just lose the room. This is the most important, okay? As I said in the incrementalism, you simply cannot theorize about the right answer beforehand. It's too complicated. Even if you could theorize about it, it would take years of research to theorize about it, and we don't have years. So what you need to do, what we've found to be very successful is, you do a bunch of pretty smart things, and then you just try them and see what happens. In order to do that, you need to have a really rigorous protocol for trying them. So you need to measure live business metrics, not offline machine learning results. They can go in opposite directions. In this case, you need to look at network effects, and you have to have causation. You can't do a before and after experiment because you can't tell whether the before and after difference was causal. So quickly going through this, let's say we just tried to do an A-B test on the orders, right? Some orders we get, get algorithm A, some orders get algorithm B. That's actually nonsensical. You have a bunch of, uh, a bunch of riders that are all together in one network, it doesn't even mean anything to have two algorithms in like a race condition to assign each of the riders. Your, 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 your world would sort of collapse. But let's say it didn't. The knock-on effects from one of these algorithms being faster would spool into the, other, into the other set of orders. So your A experience would be perturbed by the fact that there were network effects from the B experience. So you simply can't do that. OK, so let's take different cities as different independent networks. Okay? Let's do some cities get treatment A, other cities get treatment B. That doesn't work because when we started this, we had 75 cities. Call it 100 cities. Okay? 
n of 100 is not good enough to get good statistical sensitivity with an A-B test design. So we went to a blocked design. Okay, every city gets A and then B and then A and then B on different days. So every day and city pair is, is an isolated observation of the network. But then notice that the first day of the experiment may have been really nasty rain throughout England. Okay, if the first day of the experiment is really nasty rain, then A is going to be sort of bad observations in all of these. So then you don't have causal, you don't have causal interpretation. So finally, we did a counterbalanced, randomized design to restore causal interpretation. Half of the cities get B, A, B, A, and the other half get A, B, A, B. So this gives us, with just N of 100, statistical power that is as good as we would have gotten if we ran it on 100,000 orders, but allows you to have all of the orders on the same day in the same city getting the same treatment so you can capture those network effects. So, the, the randomized block design gives you statistical power, causal interpretation, and network effects. So this is just an illustration of how much time we put into developing rigorous experimentation techniques without which, before we had those, we were paralyzed. You could do all the work on the machine learning and, and the optimization and the, and the incrementalism. You just can't move if you can't tell what's, what's really happening as a result of what you've done. So we achieved transformation with AI with just really classic principles of science and machine learning, or science and engineering, uh, incrementalism, bias to simplicity, and rigorous experimentation. Thank you. Sure, sure. So the question was, how do we do feature engineering for categorical variables? We use dummy coding, which is close to one-hot encoding. Okay. I just... You do get a lot of features, so you have to be judicious there. Regularization is essential. You can't... You, we, we have, you know, many hundreds of thousands of parameters. You have to regularize. Okay. Let's, let's take one in the, the back. Hi, sure. I really like Sure, so I think the bias to experimentation and, and the rigorous experimentation come from psychology. I wouldn't, say I, I wouldn't say it makes somebody better than people that come from other fields. People have their own styles and own strengths. I think the, the experimentation, the mix, of, the mix of empiricism and bits of machine learning together can be very effective. I'd just like to remind everybody that although the next speaker in this room has canceled, we've got a few minutes here with Michael if he would want to hang around, but there will be um, a speaker starting in the other rooms about now. So um, time to move on if you need to go to another one.